Hey, 42 here. Saturday the 1st of November, 1755, dawned like any other day in the beautiful city of Lisbon. Dock workers unloaded cargoes of spices, sugar and gold in the harbour. Priests prepared sermons for mass later that day, and coach drivers navigated the narrow, bustling streets. It was All Saints' Day, an important religious celebration for the almost entirely Catholic population, and excitement was building for the festivities that lay ahead. But that excitement wouldn't last for long, because by the time the sun set that evening, the magnificent city of Lisbon would be in ruins, and tens of thousands of people would be dead. The cause of all this destruction? An apocalypse-class earthquake, the biggest in European history by a huge margin. Measuring in at an estimated magnitude of between 8.5 and 9, it released around 10 times more energy than any other earthquake ever recorded in Europe. But it isn't just the sheer scale of destruction that makes the Great Lisbon Earthquake so fascinating. No, it's what happens next. The biggest earthquakes have the power to level entire cities, but the Lisbon quake of 1755 did so much more than that. It shook the very foundations of human society, triggered a philosophical, scientific and cultural aftershock that still reverberates to this day. This wasn't just an earthquake, it was a turning point in history. This is the story of a natural disaster so devastating, it literally changed the world. This is the story of the Lisbon earthquake. Now for a quick ad from Raycon. I love the feeling of autumn when the leaves begin to turn. I remember when I was a kid, this time of year was always synonymous with back to school shopping. Do you remember that? New notebooks, new shoes, new routines. Well, I may not be in school anymore, but I still love that feeling of starting fresh. So this autumn, I'm starting anew with Raycon's Everyday Earbuds Classic. They are a must for getting back into a routine and making every day just feel a little bit smoother. Raycon's Everyday Earbuds Classic are packed with features such as active noise cancellation and multi-point connectivity, and they have up to 32 hours of battery life with the case. And they have a quick charge function, which after 10 minutes gives you 90 minutes of playtime. Also, I absolutely adore this protective case that I bundled with my Raycons. This color is called Concrete and it looks incredible. I use my Raycons around the house to listen to audiobooks and music whilst doing chores and stuff, or when cooking dinner. They just stay so snug in my ears, they sound amazing, and the battery lasts for so long. Over three million customers already love Raycons, and they come with a 30-day happiness guarantee. So, if you don't love them, the returns are easy. Click the link in the description box, or go to buyraycon.com 42 to get 20% off site-wide. That's buyraycon.com slash 42. All Saints Day was an important festival in 18th century Portugal, and pretty much everyone in Lisbon had turned out to celebrate. One of the highlights of the day was attending mass in one of the city's 40-odd churches. And that's exactly where a huge chunk of the city's population could be found when the ground first began to shake. Those initial tremors were mild, producing just enough of a rumble to set church bells jangling across the city. But within seconds, that distant rumble became an almighty roar as the ground began to shake with almost unbelievable violence. Within a matter of seconds, buildings began to fall. Houses folded like sun-dried sandcastles. Church domes cracked and collapsed onto terrified congregations and entire streets disappeared into giant fissures that appeared all over the city. The first shake lasted about six minutes. Now in most contexts, six minutes isn't a long time. But when the ground beneath your feet is booking like a rodeo bull on meth, it sure feels like an eternity. Eventually, the ground started behaving like ground again. But just as Lisbon's battered citizens were getting their bearings, a powerful aftershock hit. It was shorter than the initial quake, just a couple of minutes by most accounts, but if anything, it was even more extreme. According to our best estimates, the Lisbon earthquake of 1755 
released as much energy as 38,000 nuclear bombs. It was almost unimaginably devastating. Lisbon was shaken to its very core. Between the main quake and several aftershocks, thousands of buildings across the city had either collapsed or suffered irreparable damage. Falling masonry continued to rain down on the narrow streets and the threat of being crushed was all too real. The panicked citizens of Lisbon headed to the least built up place they could think of, the harbour. But when they got there, they were met with an incredibly strange sight. Lisbon lies on the banks of the huge tidal estuary of the River Targus. It's a massive stretch of water, 14 kilometres across at its widest, and almost all of it lies underwater, even at low tide. But not long after the earthquake struck, the water of the estuary began to rush towards the ocean, revealing hundreds of metres of riverbed that is never usually exposed. As a child of the modern age, you probably know where this is going. But to the people of Lisbon in 1755, the sight of an entire river disappearing was the equivalent of Moses passing the Red Sea. It looked like a bona fide miracle. And so the citizens of Lisbon did what humans have always done when faced with something miraculous. They barged each other out of the way to try and get a better look. Which is exactly why the colossal tsunami that hits the city soon afterwards proved to be so incredibly deadly. Caused by a colossal seafloor shift known as a megafrost earthquake at the epicenter 200 kilometers offshore, which formed tsunami waves 20 meters tall, about the height of a six-story building, which raced into the city. The destruction they caused was simply unfathomable. Within a matter of hours, Lisbon had been shaken to its foundations and buried by a literal wall of water. Tens of thousands of people were dead. But remarkably enough, the worst was still to come. In the 18th century, artificial light was still provided by fire, mostly in the form of candles or lanterns. Being All Saints Day, there was even more open flames around than usual. Lighting candles to honor various saints was an essential part of the celebration. When the earthquake first struck, the shaking triggered hundreds of small-scale fires, as candles and lanterns were knocked to the ground. Compared to what followed, these mini conflagrations seemed like small potatoes. You don't stop to put out a pan fire if the roof is collapsing on your head. But left to grow unchecked, these isolated fires soon spread, eventually morphing into a raging firestorm that tore through the city every bit as fast as the tsunami had. Once it got a foothold, the towering inferno was impossible to stop. With rubble clogging the streets and the surviving citizens in disarray, organizing any semblance of a proper firefight was just out of the question. The earthquake had been lethal, the tsunami devastating, but neither had claimed as many lives as the fire. It raged for six full days, and at its peak it guzzled oxygen so greedily that bystanders are said to have died of asphyxiation at a distance of 30 meters from the flames. By the time the monster had finally burnt itself out, the once beautiful city of Lisbon was a charred, smoldering ruin. Estimates vary, but by most accounts, some 50,000 people died in the tragedy, about a fifth of the city's population. And upwards of 85% of the buildings were destroyed. It's truly hard to imagine a more destructive natural disaster. But so far, we've only talked about Lisbon itself, and I promised you a history-altering event here. So how exactly can an earthquake change the course of history? Well, it turns out there's lots of ways. The Lisbon earthquake of 1755 triggered the first ever modern systematic disaster response led to the design of the first earthquake-resistant urban center and led to the development of an entire new branch of science. More on all of those in just a minute. But first, let's talk about something even bigger, because the Great Lisbon Earthquake of 1755 didn't just change the way we plan for disasters, it changed the way that we, as an entire species, view the world around us. In the 18th century, the dominant theory as to what caused earthquakes could be summed up in three words. God did it. 
Earthquakes, and all other natural disasters for that matter, were almost universally seen as acts of God, usually dished out as punishment for bad behaviour, Sodom and Gomorrah style. But as Europe tried to come to terms with what had happened to the once grand city of Lisbon on that fateful November day, this trusty old explanation just didn't quite add up. It wasn't just the severity of the disaster, or the number of lives it claimed. It was the entire context. The earthquake struck during a major religious festival, when most of Lisbon's Christian population was actively engaged in worship. Why would God, even angry Old Testament God, strike down his own devout followers whilst they were busy praising his name? It just didn't make any sense. Beyond the timing, there also seemed to be no rhyme or reason regarding who or what survived the carnage. For one thing, thousands of innocent children were amongst the dead, and whilst the majority of the city's many churches were basically deleted off the map, the streets of the Alfama district, lined with brothels, taverns and gambling dens, were amongst the least affected. So if this was God sending a message to his flock, it was a seriously fucking confusing one. And that got people thinking what might once have been considered a blasphemous thought. What if God wasn't behind the earthquake after all? What if what happened to Lisbon was not divine retribution, but something else entirely? It was one of Europe's greatest thinkers, German philosopher Immanuel Kant, who first formally suggested what that something might be. He theorised that the Lisbon earthquake, and others like it, were caused by the movement of gases in caverns deep underground. He was dead wrong, obviously. Nice try, Emmanuel. But the idea was incredibly important nonetheless, because it was one of the first modern attempts to explain earthquakes in scientific rather than supernatural terms. Kant would go on to publish several papers about the Lisbon quake. They are perhaps the first scientific texts ever written on a subject that, at the time, hadn't even been named yet. Today, we would call it seismology, the study of earthquakes. And it wasn't just Kant who was beginning to see the world in a new way. Across Europe, great thinkers of the Age of Enlightenment, including the likes of Voltaire, grappled with the implications of the Lisbon earthquake, and everything it meant for the long-held belief that natural disasters were part of a divine plan or punishment. And, slowly but surely, opinions began to shift. Back in Lisbon, the recovery effort began almost immediately, and that was largely thanks to one man, Sebastião José de Cavalho Emelio, better known these days as the Marquis of Pombal. As the most senior minister in the Portuguese government, he was given full control of both the disaster response and the rebuild that followed it. The first order of business was to regain some semblance of control. Even with the disaster itself over, the situation inside the city limits was still incredibly dangerous. There was a constant threat from building collapses and falling masonry, and with thousands of bodies littering the streets, the risk of major disease outbreak was enormous. Then there were the bands of opportunistic thieves that had already begun widespread looting across the city. Without strong leadership, chaos would have reigned in the ruins of Lisbon. The Marquis of Pombal would be accused of many things in his long political career, but being weak certainly wasn't one of them. He convinced King José I that he would need additional powers to effectively manage the crisis. The king obliged, granting Pombal near total executive control of the country and its resources. From that point on, the Marquis of Pombal effectively became the de facto ruler of the country. The first thing he did was bring in the Portuguese army, along with as many able-bodied survivors as he could find. He ordered that the streets be cleared of rubble, and the bodies either be burnt in mass graves, or simply dumped in the sea. That meant forgoing some, okay all, of the usual funeral rites. But given the circumstances, nobody complained too loudly. As for the looters, Pombal put them in mass graves too. Well, 
kind of. He ordered that gallows be built all over the city and anyone found looting was simply executed on the spot. As you can imagine, behaviour improved pretty rapidly after that. Pombal sourced grain and other staples from the surrounding areas to ensure everyone had enough to eat. He even introduced price caps on all produce to prevent profiteering. Along with all the practical stuff, the Marquis did something completely new. He sent out hundreds of questionnaires to try to gather as much information as he could about the earthquake. Details like what time it struck in different parts of Portugal, how long it lasted, what direction it seemed to come from, and how many aftershocks there were. This questionnaire is widely regarded as being the first systematic study of an earthquake's effects in history, and it came decades before modern seismology even existed. Just like Immanuel Kant over in Germany, the Marquis was beginning to understand that the earthquake wasn't the random tantrum of an angry god, but a natural phenomenon that could be measured and understood. It might not sound like much today, but in the 18th century, that was revolutionary. And it's thanks to the answers he received that we know so much about an earthquake that took place almost 300 years ago. Once the city was mostly clear of rubble, it was time to rebuild the Portuguese capital. But Pombal wasn't content simply to replace what had been lost. He saw the earthquake as an opportunity to completely redesign the city. Thanks to his dawning understanding of earthquakes as normal, perhaps even inevitable natural phenomena, he knew that no matter how well behaved the people of Portugal were, it could happen again at any point, and he wanted to make sure that if it did, Lisbon would be ready. And so, he rebuilt the capital from the ground up with earthquake readiness in mind. He ordered his best engineers to come up with brand new building designs that could withstand the violent shaking of an earthquake. Then, he took the most promising ones and he tested them. Obviously, he couldn't summon earthquakes at will, so instead he had his engineers build scale models of their designs, then he had dozens of troops march around them in unison. Their synchronised footsteps mimicked the rhythmic stresses of an earthquake. Crude though they were, these were astonishingly forward-thinking experiments by 18th century standards. In fact, they're thought to have been the first seismic simulations in architectural history. The result was this. The Pombaline Cage, a flexible wooden lattice with diagonal bracing that provided both strength and flexibility to help buildings withstand the shaking of an earthquake. These cages were built into the walls of hundreds of new buildings across the city. Many of them are still there today. That in itself is a testament to their effectiveness. Lisbon has been hit by several big earthquakes since the Big Daddy of 1755, and, for the most part, the Pombaline cages performed remarkably well. Along with the new earthquake-resistant buildings, the Marquis completely redesigned the layout of much of the city, particularly the downtown district. He did away with those narrow, winding streets, replacing them with wide thoroughfares. It wasn't an aesthetic choice. Given what had happened after the earthquake, he wanted wider streets to act as fire breaks. These ideas may seem like common sense by modern standards, but at the time they were genuinely revolutionary, particularly in Europe. The Lisbon that emerged from the rubble of the 1755 earthquake was the first European city ever designed with earthquake resilience in mind, and the principles that guided its reconstruction are still used today. The Great Lisbon Earthquake of 1755 remains the most powerful ever recorded in Europe and is one of its greatest tragedies. What began as a day of celebration turned into a nightmare of earth, fire and water that claimed tens of thousands of lives. But from the ruins of a shattered city, a new idea emerged in some people's minds that our world is governed not by the whims of fate or wrathful gods, but by natural laws. Laws that can be studied, tested and understood. That idea lies at the very heart of what we now call science, and it has been shaping the modern world ever since. Thanks for watching.